you have a new book out, A Template for Understanding Big Debt Crises. And Ray, to me, the underlying message of this book is that history is doomed to repeat itself. Have I got that right? Yeah, the everything happens over and over again for similar cause-effect relationships, right. So, and, that, that, I mean, that, that sounds like an awfully depressing reality. Does it, does, it, does it need to be a depressing reality? Well, I mean, it's like any reality. Uh, you know, you've got to embrace the reality and know how to deal with it. Uh, you, yeah, there are debt cycles, and debt cycles provide great opportunities, and they provide real problems. So I, th I think it's just like a, a progression, a disease that progresses. And the reason I wrote the book um, is it actually was just a compendium of research that I wrote mostly before the financial crisis. And it's because I think it's essential for everybody to understand the sequence of events, the logical sequence of events that makes these all the same. So as you know, there's 48 of them in there. They all play out pretty much the same way, except there are inflationary and deflationary ones depending on the currency. But basically, I'm in 60 pages, I just want to convey that template. So let's talk about one of those two types of debt crises, the inflationary depression. Mm -hmm. Is that what's playing out right now in Turkey, in Argentina, in emerging markets more broadly? Yeah, certainly. And this has all played out many times. This isn't the first time that Argentina has gone through it. It has a habit of going through it. And it's not the first time it's happened anywhere else. So you could follow it. I mean, basically, the big deal is whether the currency is denominated, the debt is denominated in your own currency or in your foreign currency. And when it's denominated in foreign currency, like these countries have a lot of dollar denominated debt, then it, it, they have a problem trying to service that dollar denominated debt. When the dollar goes up and the money they're earning is in local currency, then they don't have enough cash and then they get into that spiral and as a result of that, they have to print more money, the currency depreciates and it happens in a very mechanical way. Most of the countries don't have reserve currencies, don't have the debt denominated in their own currency and as a result, most of their crises are of that sort. And there's a dynamic as to how they complete the cycle. In other words, what happens is when the currency goes down in value, essentially because of inflation and the like, they wipe out the local currency debt. If you own the local currency debt, you're wiped out. You've evaluated 27 of these non-domestic currency crises in the book. So take what's happening today in Argentina, Turkey, and like I say, emerging markets more broadly, and compare it, if you would, to some of the things that we might remember. There are some people who are old enough to recall the peso crisis of 1994, the Asian currency crisis of 97, or perhaps the Russian debt default in 98, or the Argentine default of 2001. This looks most like what to you? Well, it, it looks like that. It looks like those, because the currency depreciation um, then also raises the interest rate differential. And um, in the process of wiping out the local currency denominated debt, because it's essentially monetized away, the currency becomes cheaper. All the crises are self-correcting mechanisms. So when the currency becomes cheaper, then it becomes more, the balance of payments improves because they can sell more or uh, they import less. And also they begin to attract capital if they remain a healthy place for people to invest but that's capital. But not, that's not happening that's, yet. These, just, these, just, these countries put, haven't hit bottom, have well, they? No, but they're, uh, I would say, two-thirds on the way toward uh, hitting bottom, I believe. And then what happens is, then it depends on what the monetary policy operates like. Because the question will be whether those who are holding those currencies will receive an interest rate differential that will compensate for the depreciation and the value of the currency. And so the central bank at some point, um, sometimes through IMF support or sometimes through that other, just a tightening of monetary policy, has to create an interest rate that will offset both the inflation rate and the depreciation of the currency. And knowing how that mechanically happens is the means by which you can identify the bonds, the bottoms in those currencies. I see. When you say that 
to you it looks as though they're two-thirds on the way toward the bottom now. Does that mean, is it as simple as saying that there's still a one-third depreciation left in their currencies before they're able to reach that point where they can, where the currencies are cheap enough to attract new capital and restore uh, the balance of payments? Yeah. Speaking as a generalization, I, I'm saying that they are, uh, that if, you, if those place out classically, what they'll have is large fiscal deficits. And how they choose to monetize those fiscal deficits or how they choose to restructure their balance sheets through IMF loans or through the tightening of monetary policy will be the determinant of the exact bottoms in those currencies, right? And so, but just generally speaking, the greater of the moves is behind us, the greater of the concern, we will have a lot of panic we uh, and more panic, uh, and you'll have that. And as the saying goes, the time to buy is when there's blood in the streets, right? And to know when there's value, and those are the calculations one has to do. Is there enough blood in the streets yet to see value? We're, uh, I think we're getting there, generally speaking. And I think, um, I think it's important also, that that's that case of inflationary depressions. I think we should also think of the types of depressions that we go through because um, I think that's also interesting. Uh, well, let's talk about that. We just lived through the aftermath of a big debt crisis, the kind of thing that you say in your book comes along every 70 years or so. But we're in the midst of another bubble. Is that we're in the midst of another cycle? Um, no, I don't, I don't think we're in the midst right now of another bubble. Uh, let, me, let me maybe clarify. Um, when you hit zero interest rates, you have a different type of debt crisis. You have more likely to have a depression. So I think the period that we're in is very similar to the 1935-1940 period. Let me just um, explain that in a minute. Um, 1929 to 1932, we had a debt crisis and interest rates hit zero. Not 2007 to 2009, we have a debt crisis that hits zero. Then in both of those cases, there's only one thing for central banks to do, and that is to print money and buy financial assets. They print money by financial assets in both of those times. That pushes financial asset prices up, puts a lot of liquidity in, and also contributes to a greater wealth gap. Because those who own financial assets benefit when those who don't own financial assets. As a result, in both periods of time of the wealth gap and the economy not improving for a large segment of the population, we have populism. So the last time that we would say when was populism popular, it would be in, the, uh, in that period of time. That populism issue is an important issue. So as we look forward and we say when the next uh, downturn comes, which will happen probably in a couple of years, um, we're going to have a different type of downturn, very similar to the one that happened in 1937 to the 1940 period. We, have, we are in the part of the cycle now that the Fed and other central banks, in varying degrees, are beginning to tighten monetary policy. Asset prices are sensitive to monetary policy because the duration of those assets is lengthened. And so the, it, central banks have to be very careful not to raise interest rates much faster than is built into the curve. But with that populism, uh, we have an issue. Um, so if we think about what the next downturn will be like, the downturn, I think, will be very different than the one in 2008. It'll be one in which um, I think that the social and political problems will be great because of that wealth gap in populism. I think there'll be more conflict. Right now, times are good, and we're uh, sort of at each other's throats in that. I also think, I also worry about the effectiveness in monetary policy in reversing that because monetary policy uh, has interest rates and we can't lower interest rates as much and it has quantitative easing, the purchases of financial assets to push other financial assets out and get liquidity into the system and that is at its maximum. So when we have a downturn, we're not going to have it to be as effective. I think also the downturn um, in our form of debt crisis won't just be do debts. It'll also be pension obligations, health care obligations, unfunded lob obligations. So, so and I think one, one more thing, and I think it'll be um, about um, 
us having to sell a lot of Treasury bonds to the rest of the world. And I think that that'll also be an issue about two years out. So I would say two years out is when I'm worried about. And I, and I would think that um, that's for these various reasons. Speaking in financial terms, if we look at what you're seeing through the lens of the markets, how bad is it likely to be relative to what we went through in 2008, 2009? Oh, I don't think that it's going to be as sharp and severe like that. I think it's more going to grind on. And I think the, um, um, it, it, all of these obligations will be a problem to be funded. And I think it'll be more back there of a dollar crisis than it would be a debt crisis. And I think it'll be more of a political and social crisis what than a big, a big sharp crisis? there. Well, when we have to sell a lot of treasury bonds to the rest of the, we have to sell a lot of treasury bonds. And we, as Americans, um, will not be able to buy all of those treasury bonds. And if interest rates rise too much, the way it usually works is that constricts credit. We borrow less. And that creates a weakness in the economy. So instead, because we'll sell to foreigners, the, uh, from a foreign perspective, when they look at it, they, they care not about inflation. They care about currency depreciation when they look at the interest rate. So if a currency goes down, it be, the bonds become cheaper. I think the Federal Reserve at that point will have to print more money to make up the, for the deficit, have to monetize more of the, so and that, that'll cause um, a depreciation in the value of the dollar. I think we're, we risk, um, we, we have the privileged position of being able to borrow in our own currency because we have the world's leading reserve currency. I think we are risking that by our um, finances, in other words, borrowing too much. And you can get to the point where, um, you know, others, when you own a bond in a, in a U.S. bond or in any particular currency, you're getting a pile of that currency. By how much could the dollar go down? Well, I, you know, you could have, um, you easily could have a 30 percent uh, depreciation in the dollar through that period of time. You know, it depends how long, 30 percent, I would say. Ray, some people say that, you know, to use, to borrow Ken Rogoff's terminology, this time is different, that because the post-crisis recovery was so slow, because we've had a massive tax cut in the United States, because the Trump administration is deregulating the economy, that GDP growth is going to keep on accelerating and that a downturn or a recession is many, many, many years away, not two years away. I take it you don't agree. Um, I, I, I just do the calculations and um, the fiscal stimulation that we're having is coming at a higher rate of capacity utilization, a higher rate. And so we're getting that stimulation at the late part of a cycle. And that's what we're having. And that's a stimulant that will last for particularly. It feels overnight. good, right? Uh, Wages are rising. The unemployment rate is at a record yeah. low. Feeling good is not an indicator of the future. Um, euphoria is when, as bubbles are made of euphoria, by the way, so they feel the best, right? But I'm just doing the calculations, and what I'm saying is that right now the fiscal stimulus is coming in, and that's good. Um, productivity is enhanced by corporate tax cuts. A lot of money's going to the companies. They're, they have lots of cash. That is good for the time being. If you do where, when that stimulus passes through and then diminishes, that, that diminishes in about 18 months and two years. <clears throat> but the borrowing doesn't. So the borrowing will be in the marketplace about that time. I'm not, I'm, I'm not be, trying to be precise as to exactly what year or what month um, that has. I think we're nine years into the cycle. And um, the cycles are the, are the cycles. And the balance of payments and supply, demand, and credit is what it is. And so I'm saying that we're probably in the seventh inning of this game. And um, therefore, I'm not particularly worried at the moment. But if I was to take, um, as we get to the ninth inning of the game, or the, then we're going to be. How, how do people um, apply this? And, 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 and the important thing, I think, is not even what I think about this. The important thing is for you and each person to really study how these cycles work. In the book, 
Uh, we, we show how all 48 of the cycles over the last, 40, uh, 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 last 100 years that were significant followed the same path. So for 60 pages of reading, I want to interrupt uh, just you can a get that. And by the way, I'm making it free so that everybody can have it. And, and that's an important point. People can download a copy of the book on your website, principles.com. But, Ray, one thing I want to ask. People go, download the book, read it, analyze it, understand what you can help them with is application. If you're right, if we're seven, seventh inning into this ball game, the downturn is two years away, what do you do? How do you invest? What's prudent? Investors have a choice of whether they're trying to be active investment investors in market time, which most of them are not going to be able to do well. That's a, a professional's game, and it's tough to do it as a professional. And then there are emotions and all of the things that enter into that. So I would say that, generally speaking, they should not be actively trying to invest. Or if they do, I would not recommend it. But if they do, then they have to go opposite their instincts. You know, buy when the blood, blood is in the streets and sell when times are good. If, but it, what I would say is important, just like we were even talking about uh, pr prior to the show, is to be able to have uh, 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 know how to have balance in the portfolio, know how to achieve that. Because each market performs as a reflection of the economy at the time, and all of the economy's characteristics keeps changing. There's inflation and deflation and all that. Balance is key. 